good morning. So um, I'm going to be talking about a variety of things related to what we do at Argon. Um, a lot of it is oriented towards applications. Um, I used to be a mathematician eh, earlier in my career, uh, and but I was an applied mathematician, and so I always got the most um, pleasure out of seeing things in math, mathematical models, science applied to various things, and I'll show you a number of examples of that. But first, a little bit of background for, I'll be talking about Argonne National Lab a little bit. It's one of the Department of Energy Labs. Our uh, leadership computing facility and how it uh, came to be. And then some of the interesting stuff, at least to me, and I hope to you, of simulations. Um, and then I, I give you uh, information as to how you can apply for time on our resources, and I hope some of you do, as well as a training program on what we call like extreme scale as opposed to exascale um, computing, um, which I also hope you can uh, either uh, apply to attend or encourage uh, some of your colleagues to apply for that. And uh, finally, I'll say a few words about a procurement that Argonne, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory uh, have out on the street for their next machines a mere four to five years from now. So here's an aerial shot of uh, much of Argonne National Lab. It's about 25 miles southwest of downtown Chicago. Uh, it was uh, created in around 1946 as an outgrowth of the uh, experimental facility at the University of Chicago that Enrico Fermi used to do the first controlled nuclear re reaction. In fact, Enrico Fermi was very instrumental in setting up Argonne National Laboratory. Now, I pointed out, or I labeled two parts of the lab towards the, uh, the top, the advanced photon source. It's one of, it's the, um, uh, this hemisphere's most intense source of uh, x-rays. And so it is used to find the structure of many things, both biological and um, materials uh, that you would use to build things. Um, it has 40 beam lines, and um, so some of them are built and operated by companies. Uh, Eli Lilly, for example, is a pharmaceutical company that uses, uh, that has a beam line and sends the results. Uh, but most of the beam lines are uh, a national or international resource. There are about 5,000 users a year, and people use it to uh, understand the structure of many things. I'll get back to that in a few minutes. Uh, now, the lab was created to investigate uh, the peaceful uses of the atom of atomic energy. Uh, and over the years, it has continued to do a lot of fundamental research, uh, such as the APS, but uh, also more recently, uh, a lot of things to do with energy storage. So batteries, for example, the, uh, the battery that's used in the Chevy Volt was designed at Argonne and licensed to General Motors. Um, now, we've been in computing for a long time. Um, yeah, remember that John von Neumann at Princeton uh, designed a computer uh, at the Institute for Advanced Sciences, and people at Argonne found out about it and um, asked, you know, could we borrow the, the plan for how to build it? And so Argonne did build it, and so it was known as Avidac, Argonne's version of the Institute's digital arithmetic computer. It was actually completed before the one at Princeton was. And um, you know, innovative things were done, such as you know, one of our early computers, uh, Margaret Butler, wrote you know, adaptive floating point arithmetic done interpretively. So it wasn't very fast. As you can see, memory access time, 15 microseconds, Addition was not too bad, but a multiplication took a millisecond. Now, in those days, the word computer was applied to people whose job it was to use um, usually calculators like Monroe adding machines to compute. And so the press release at the time was that this is 100,000 times as fast as a trained computer using a desk calculator. Now, um, there were others, uh, so Oak Ridge found out about Avidac and said, gee, can we use that? And, and so um, that idea. And so Argonne designed 
uh, and built Oracle, which is Oak Ridges, et cetera, et cetera, and that was installed at Oak Ridge. Now, there's a link to Stanford. There are probably quite a few more, but um, this is a photograph taken at Argonne of the George Unified System, and the um, fellow with uh, his chin on his uh, hand uh, that I've blocked out is Bill Miller. So Bill Miller was the director of the Applied Mathematics Division at Argonne, and um, Forsyth convinced him to come and join the computer science department here when it was just being created. Um, Bill Miller later became provost and vice president for research for Stanford, president of SRI, and he's still around the emeritus in um, I think the Hoover Institute. So anyway, I thought it'd be fun to point out that link. Now, um, recently I was talking to a colleague and he said, you talk about leadership computing facility, that's a strange name for something. How did that arise? Well, it arose in 2004 when a law was passed by Congress that told DOE, you must establish facilities that will lead the world, essentially. And, and so in the actual law, I didn't bother including all of that, there, there is the phrase leadership computing. Now, our, why did this happen in 2004? It was because of Japan's Earth Simulator, which had become the world's fastest computer. Now, it was amusing to me that uh, in 2004 and three, it became a big deal because in the year 2000, I um, uh, made a presentation to a, a subcommittee of Congress in which I showed a slide saying, this is where we are in our biggest facilities for computing, and here's where Japan is going to be in a couple of years. Um, and somehow that didn't have the impact. Once the Earth Simulator was actually running, uh, of course it did. So this, there is this law in 2004 that says the Department of Energy has a responsibility for this, and it shall be an open facility. That is, that people compete for time on it, uh, you don't have to have DOE funding for your research. You can be from another country. Uh, the only thing is, first, it's a peer review, pretty stiff competition that I'll describe later. Uh, but then um, you have to make your results public in some fashion. And so we do have industry that uh, gets awards of uh, time on this. Uh, and some of it, I'm sure, is quite useful to the company. But some of the useful results are also revealed to the world through journal articles or presentations. So Department of Energy uses the word facility, the singular, uh, but there are two places where it's uh, uh, installed. One is at Argonne, and, and one is at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Now, one thing that I, as a someone interested in computational science, really like is that you know, when the Department of Energy issued a, a report on facilities for the future of science the next 20 years, um, computing was um, the uh, highest priority for national facilities. The international ones is ITER, the uh, fusion energy experiment that's be, uh, being built in France. And so, as I mentioned, these are facilities that are open and you get time by competing on them. So. At Argonne, currently, we have an IBM Blue Gene Q that we call Mira. And the things that I would point out about it is uh, it has a, you know, a fair number of nodes, 48K. Um, each um, node has 16 gigabytes of memory, so you have three quarters of a petabyte of memory. And um, of course, some disk, uh, 35 petabytes of uh, disk attached to it. Um, but each core out of those three quarters of, of a million cores has four hardware threads. And so you have over three million hardware parallelism. Now, why is that important? Um, because as we heard yesterday, uh, I suspect most of you were here yesterday, the, the next generations of machines will have more and more parallelism. Each core is not going to get much faster. Now, some of the parallelism is uh, expressed in uh, GPUs with you know, what you can think of as really small threads, very specialized ones, but massive parallelism is the game. And so if you like, today you can start 
experimenting with this level of parallelism. And we do have scientific applications and engineering applications that today use the full machine for real production calculations. Um, now we have several other systems, you know, like smaller versions of MIRA for testing and for people getting started. But in the lower right there, I point out one called Tuki, named after the, the Tuki of the Pulley Tuki algorithm. Uh, that's a visualization and analysis cluster. It's directly connected to the same 35 petabytes of disk. So when you do a, a simulation, write the results to disk, then you can visualize and analyze them on Tuki, uh, which is more of a general purpose and GPU cluster, you know, without having to copy it. It's doesn't have to be copied to a different system. Now, Oak Ridge's uh, system is um, faster than ours. Uh, our peak speed is 10 petaflops. Uh, Oak Ridge's peak speed is 27 petaflops, uh, but it's based on largely the um, NVIDIA GPUs. It has one NVIDIA Kepler for each of its nodes. It has you know, th about 300,000 Optron cores, but uh, 18,688 NVIDIA Keplers. And, and so the 27 petaflops of peak speed, if I remember correctly, something like 24 are from the um, NVIDIA uh, GPUs. And since 2004, so now it's been 10 years, if you look at measures uh, that we all hate but have to use uh, for the time being of peak speed, uh, a factor of 10,000 increase in capability. Now, if you look at the um, this um, bar graph, you can see that uh, we're here, and now it stays flat for a few years. Uh, sorry, up here. And that's because you know, we just last year installed and went into production both at Oak Ridge and Argonne with our new systems, Mira and Titan. Um, we're not scheduled to get any more systems until the next step, which will be the third generation of Argon and the fourth generation of Oak Ridge systems. And, and this is the combine. You add up the Argon and, and Oak Ridge peak speed to get these numbers. So I'll say a little bit about that towards the end of this talk. Now, we always talk about hardware, but of course, people are, I think, at least as important. And so I, I wanted to stress that, you know, of course, we have an excellent operations staff that uh, you know, stays up nights even though they're, they're not supposed to and weekends and uh, gets things running and keeps them running. But in addition, we have uh, some teams that not all facilities have. One is what we call the catalysts. Uh, so that is currently, I think, 14 PhD level computational scientists who have domain expertise in many areas, computational fluid dynamics, chemistry, material science, high energy physics, plasma physics, and so on. And, of course, they work in our facility and they have deep knowledge of the architecture and the software on our system. And so for the biggest um, projects that get time on our system through peer review, they get allocated not only time on the system, but they get time on the catalysts. And so the catalysts become partners. In many cases, they're co-authors of papers. And, and that's an important ingredient. You know, we also have a team of very experienced people who, that we call performance engineers, and they may drill down to, to really optimize uh, a particular algorithm, its implementation, or to um, uh, gather or produce libraries that then many people can use. And, and then because visualization so often is, is the key to understanding the results, we also have a visualization team that not only uses um, kind of commercial products or uh, uh, national lab uh, visualization products, but develops new algorithms and new ways of showing the results. Now, even though um, Mira you know, has all this parallelism, lots of cores, we do have a lot of what we call community codes installed. So the, this table shows most of them, uh, and many of the projects use them. The ones that are in darker color are ones in which not only do we have them installed, but our catalysts and performance engineers have very deep knowledge of them. In fact, often they are developers of part of those codes. And so that gives us a lot of leverage as well. 
So there is software available for real applications at scale and, um, and people with the right expertise who will work with you. So let me go through a, a few examples of the kinds of applications. Well, certainly you think of a bigger machine, you do bigger problems. So you maybe have finer resolution, finer mesh, or you can simulate for longer for whatever the phenomenon is. So, you know, Greg Holland from NCAR uh, uh, likes the model hurricanes, and, and so he chose the 2005 summer because that was the one in, that had the most hurricanes in recorded history as well as the most uh, Category 4 and 5 hurricanes. Katrina was one of them. And, and so, as I'm sure you've seen before, if you model using a 36-kilometer grid, you know, versus a 12 kilometer or a 4 kilometer, by the time you get to the 4 kilometer grid, you're starting to see something that actually looks like a hurricane, like it looks like a satellite photograph. Or, and so that was modeling a summer. Uh, what if you want to model all of the world with a little bit uh, grosser uh, resolution, 14 kilometers, but for 27 months? And so what this particular movie is showing is um, precipitable moisture in the air. And you'll start to see in the Gulf of Mexico, you know, the spawning of, uh, of hurricanes going this way, although most of the airflow tends to go towards the east. But remember, the, the hurricanes go from uh, east to west. So it took this resolution for the first time to show that in a simulation. Before, because of, uh, you know, we're doing, say, one degree, this is one-eighth of a degree of resolution, uh, it did not show that phenomenon. So it, now this is by, uh, by no means quite accurate in that the um, hurricanes tend to start earlier in the year than they should, and, and so they, it does need more. However, it does use as boundary conditions sea ice um, and uh, sea water temperature that, that were measured, so it, it uses very realistic uh, boundary conditions. And then, as you might imagine, uh, there's also room for doing a lot of uh, what we call embarrassingly parallel kinds of simulations where you run many relatively small jobs simultaneously, but you orchestrate their execution and the analysis of their results so you can keep track of them. And so this shows on the right um, my graph, the, the generation of um, the different uh, uh, jobs and um, you know how, how fast they were being processed here um, and um, using, in this case, a framework called Falcon so that it's a manageable uh, way to run and understand the results. And so as it says here, they were able to compute what well, would have taken 21 CPU years if you only use one core in a couple of hours. And so that's important if you're looking for uh, drug targets. Now, the things that I like the, the best is when one can now explain phenomena that are observed in an experiment or some other way. So, um, you know, Argonne has many facilities, and not, not only computing, and in one of the facilities, related to studying problems that nuclear reactors face in existing nuclear reactors. You have nickel, and um, so it's a metal, it's under stress, and so you can think of it as, as being pulled you know, because of the forces involved. And so this phenomenon was observed in, exp in uh, experimenting that as you got some uh, sulfur concentration with the nickel, all of a sudden you get this very nonlinear behavior. And, um, but, so the phenomenon was observed, but it was not understood. And so here, you can see that if you had just nickel, um, the simulation revealed that there will be some tears, but it doesn't come apart. However, with the pressure, what happened is that the sulfur would aggregate along the crystal boundaries of the nickel. And so it essentially created a zipper. So this simulation, which used a lot of time on many, many processors, uh, I think 130,000, uh, explained why nickel was staring. 
So, and then what's going on now by the same research group uh, led by Priya Vashista, University of Southern California, is uh, exploration, excuse me, of uh, how to uh, prevent this. And so there's a, uh, a technique that's being explored of having little nano jets, and so you have these nano bubbles that we saw uh, going very quickly. And apparently, if one does that, it tends to relieve the pressure, and so the um, sulfur doesn't uh, uh, migrates away from the grain boundaries, and so that could be a way to ameliorate uh, the problem. And um, and then this is one of my favorite examples. So Andrew Benkowski, who's a, a young uh, scientist at Argonne, uh, attacked this problem of a uh, uh, an enzyme and protein called NDM1 that was discovered in 2010. It's known as the New Delhi metallobetalactamase. Uh, it's a gene that's carried by some bacteria. Uh, and it's called New Delhi because it was first uh, discovered there. Now, the thing with this NDM1 is that it created uh, a bacteria strain that was resistant to all known antibiotics, including the ones that are known as the ones of last resort. So, it's, so therefore, they say a bacterium carrying this MDM1 gene is the most powerful superbug around. No known antibacteria can uh, prevent it from doing harm and causing very bad infections. So, the um, bacteria, the, well, this um, enzyme gene was looked at in the advanced photon source. Remember at the beginning I said Argon has this facility called the advanced photon source where you can look at structure of many things. And so its structure was developed, um, and that's the gray kind of blobs that um, are shown here. But what Andrew Benkowski did is then took that data from the APS and um, did a, um, mathematical analysis to understand why is it that antibiotics, and these are the different colors depict the structure different antibiotics, why were they not able to turn off the bad effects of MDM1? It turns out that this darker gray is a much greater cavity than is normally present in proteins, and it can essentially trap the antibiotic, and then it, it can cut uh, these rings so they're no longer effective. So now that we know this, the idea is that one can start to design new antibiotics that will be able to take care of such infections. So I, I think it's a, a great example of a combination of uh, looking at the, the structure through something like the advanced photon source and then using high-performance computing to figure out what's really going on. Um, another thing that um, I think has a lot of payoff is uh, you can guide the design of new experiments or new experimental facilities, uh, of course design new products and, and maybe predict the results of future experiments. Well, one of the things that people want to do is um, biofuels. And so Michael Crawley uh, from uh, National Renewable Energy Lab, one of the other DOE labs, um, took the um, enzymes that are most commonly used in industry for creating biofuels and using uh, molecular level theory of uh, enzymes that can catalyze repeatedly, that is, they, don't, they, they stay active and, and effective for uh, a long time to figure out how to design even better enzymes. And so this is uh, essentially a cartoon. And you can think of it as um, a little bit like a lawnmower going in this direction, and it's taking up this you know, top layer and encapsulating it in here and, and then converting it into a useful biofuel. So that I think of as a new material. Um, I mentioned that you know, people from other countries can get access, and in fact, uh, Thierry Poinceau uh, uh, has uh, been the PI on several projects, and he's at Surfax in France. And one of the things uh, he's been looking at is um, 
simulations of explosions in semi-confined domains, such as this one here and towards the bottom. It shows a, uh, uh, an enclosure with some obstacles, and, it, and so that shows what happens. So as a result, as I put in the red type, his simulations uh, resulted in commissioning a new experiment, uh, which was motivated by the simulation. And the result is uh, what supposedly is a, the largest database wor worldwide for turbulent planes at, at high Reynolds numbers. That's Uh, another combustion example uh, done by um, Li Shun of Cascade Technologies, as, as I'd say, an industry, uh, does um, a software. Here the idea is uh, you have uh, burners, and uh, when the, the uh, flames start oscillating, uh, different parts of the uh, burner will get more heat than is desirable, and so they wear out faster. And, and so that's... Uh, a snapshot of an existing one, and then this one is of a modification on the design, and although there's still a lot of activity going on, you can see that it's a little bit more orderly than this one, and so this should result in, um, in uh, longer lasting and more efficient uh, burners. Uh, General Electric um, is um, uh, Global Research has several projects that it's had in, uh, at Argonne. Uh, this one has to do with uh, wind turbine blades. And so um, in the image here, you can see a, a wind turbine blade, Reynolds number one and a half million, and at a particular flow angle near stall, 10.3 degrees. And, and that way they can design quieter and more efficient blades for wind turbines. And an example of a lithium air battery, um, it was believed, based on experiments, that propylene carbonate, PC, uh, would be a great electrolyte for lithium air batteries. However, simulations using real science and mathematics found that, in fact, PC is not stable. Uh, and uh, you know, its chemical reactions decrease the efficiency very rapidly. And so not only did the simulation indicate that it was a dead end to go after PC, but I also explained why. And, um, and so it excluded PC as a viable candidate. So that's a negative result, but it's a very useful one. It probably saved people a lot of time and, and maybe millions of dollars. <coughs> and um, the last example of this kind that I'll mention is um, one by Benoit Roux, who's at the University of Chicago. Incidentally, Argonne National Laboratory is operated by uh, a limited uh, liability corporation of the University of Chicago. So, you know, my paycheck uh, says University of Chicago. It doesn't say uh, federal government. Uh, Benoit also has an appointment at Argonne. And, and he's looking at something that um, hopefully will help in the design of drugs for uh, uh, various diseases, including Parkinson's disease. So this is a very recent result, um, and um, it's, I'm, I'm not a biologist, and uh, it's fairly complicated, but you know, the bottom line is that it seems to have uh, yielded a lot of insight as to how to develop drugs against such a neurodegenerative diseases. Now, in the almost all these examples, or possibly all of them, I mentioned, uh, there, although I didn't mention it, the, the right-hand pane talked about Argonne Leadership Computing Facility contributions. And that, you know, I didn't feel was um, worth dwelling on in, in most of the cases, but that's uh, examples of what those catalysts, those computational scientists that work with the projects have done. In some cases, it's you know, simply um, tuning something. In other cases, uh, it was, um, you know, actually to put new capabilities, or modeling capabilities, into the software that was being used, and often optimizing things. Now, as you can imagine, as we are, see what's going on with all these applications, uh, often we see that there's something missing or something that could be done better. And so, just two quick examples are 
I mentioned we have a visualization team, and you know they developed a way of visualizing adaptive grids. A lot of people use adaptive mesh requirement these days because that's how you can model things better, but you end up with huge volumes of data that you then need to visualize to figure out what the heck is going on. And uh, Mike Papka and his team you know, developed a, a new way of visualizing adaptive grids that got the best paper award last uh, uh, fall, I guess. And, um, and so that's a, now something that's of general use for the, these kinds of data. It isn't just uh, for um, a spe specific application. And then one that has to do with mathematics. Um, uh, we have the Math and Computer Science Division at Argonne, which is a sister division to us. And uh, Mihai Anitescu is a mathematician. And he got interested in modeling energy systems, uh, which you, you know, a lot of people would like to be able to in an electrical grid. And here we show um, the state of Illinois. You know, the black is the boundaries of the state. And these are all the substations and generating plants in Illinois. So you'd want to be able to inject things like wind energy, wind generated energy or solar energy. Well, those are not constant. You know, if the wind dies down in here, um, then the um, generating companies, if they're using gas turbines, would like to have at least an hour to be able to get the turbine up to speed and stable. So they, they want to know uh, ahead of time, you know, when they'll get how much, uh, energy from these various sources. They're intermittent. And there's uncertainty associated with this because if you're predicting wind speeds, you can do a pretty good job these days, but there's still a lot of uncertainty. So what Mihai developed is stochastic optimization. So think of that as optimization in the face of uncertainty. And so with this algorithm, uh, it, which also runs very fast because this is a near real-time issue. It's not something that you do over the weekend, you, you know, you want to know within typically an hour or less. Um, so it's an efficient new kind of algorithm that can optimize in the face of uncertainty. So it has other applications, but this is one of them. And um, as you might imagine, a next step is to try to do this kind of a simulation for uh, the national grid, not only for one state, but it's a you know, reasonably large uh, state. Okay, by now I'm hoping that some of you want to know how can I use the systems at Argonne or, or Oak Bridge uh, to do my science and engineering. So there are three ways you can get access to our systems. 60% of the time is through a, a process called Insight. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, so in the case of Mira, in this calendar year, we allocated 3.53 billion core hours to 40 projects, so that's almost 100 million core hours per project this calendar year through Insight. Then 30% of the time is allocated by um, DOE program managers in the Office of Science. And those projects in that 30% are ones that do have to be related to DOE is emission interests. Of course, the DOE mission is so broad that doesn't rule out a lot of people. But you know, the first one, the, the insight, they can be on anything. And you saw a lot of things that you know don't normally think of as being Department of Energy mission. And then there's 10% left, which you know sounds small, but it's still a lot of hours. And and that's the director's discretionary. So I and a couple of other people uh, look at the proposals for people who want to get started. So it's not meant for small, long-term projects to only run under that uh, program, but for people who want to, at some point, put in a successful insight or ALCC proposal, how are they going to demonstrate that they uh, can do a good job of using this system? Well, we give them DD time, director's discretionary time. Okay, so insight is this forced acronym, innovative and novel, computational impact on theory and experiment. And, and this is basically the implementation of that Act of Congress of the year 2004. So it's uh, managed by Oak Ridge and Argonne jointly. 
So it's the division directors and myself and my equivalent, uh, Jack Wells at Oak Ridge, who make the final decision. But the criteria are merit criterion. Will this research, you know, ha does it have the potential for significant domain or community impact? So how do we judge that? We have few review panels each year in September, typically 11 of them, the one for each major kind of domain, like say chemistry, plasma physics. And so we get input from people who are typically you know, fellows of uh, scientific societies, uh, department heads, very knowledgeable computational scientists. Those are our peer reviewers. And they say, you know, this, this is good, this one probably is using the wrong model or you know, whatever. But that's, on, that's the first step, that's the most important one. Secondly, computational readiness. They may have the best ideas in the world, but if they can only run on, let's say, 128 cores, they're not right for us because you know, we were established to have relatively few very large projects using lots of time, big fractions of the machine, and so we're just not the right place for a small one. So computational readiness is also judged. And, um, and their eligibility criteria are essentially none. You know, anybody can, can apply and successfully get it. So insight is a pretty um, intense competition. You know, you have to write a very substantial scientific research proposal to convince the peer reviewers and us that it's worth allocating time to the, your project. But the benefit is, if you're successful, you can do things you probably can't do anywhere else. And this gives you an idea of the uh, domains. So for the current calendar year, and we go by calendar year for insight, January 1 to December 31st, um, uh, we um, got requests for 14 billion core hours, and uh, we could award 5.8 billion. I mentioned 3.53 at Argon, the rest at Oak Ridge, total of 59 projects. And you can see the industry got um, is that 5 percent and uh, international uh, reasonable fraction. And then when we say U.S. government, that really is people at national labs or other federal agencies. And NIST, for example, has a project, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So. Um, for any of you who might be interested in using our facilities, um, there's a link for either the Argonne, the discretionary site, or the Oak Ridge. Um, you know, for Argonne, it's it's an online form, uh, and fairly lightweight, but um, you know, it's it's a way to get started. And you can think in terms of asking for up to say five million core hours. Now, um, these wonderful systems that we have are not very easy to use. And we anticipate that our next generation will be perhaps even harder to use, or we'll have to think of new ways of doing things. In addition, there are some things that people who do computational science and engineering have to learn, and frequently they're only taught that on the job, which is fine. But um, we decided that we wanted to give a head start to people who are uh, early in their career and perhaps still graduate students, but whose interest is computational science and engineering. And in a two-week, rather intensive course, uh, exposed them to a lot of approaches, methods, and information. And so I, I proposed this to the Department of Energy about a year and a half ago. Um, they gave me the funding to do it, and, and we did this for the first time last summer, and we're about to do it again this summer, August 3rd through the 15th. So let me tell you a little bit about it. Um, as I mentioned, the motivation is that you know, uh, our systems are complex. Also, uh, people are doing more complex things, so even if the computers were simple, the applications are not. A lot of multi-physics, how do you tie different models together to get one result. And mo most of these require a team. So you're working in a team, and how do you coordinate 
and establish standards uh, and checks for developing software, putting it into the code tree, and having it be stable. Um, so that was the motivation for doing that. And you know, we wanted to provide a lot of the key skills that typically are not presented in graduate school and sometimes not even at work. So as you might imagine, the curriculum does talk about computer architectures now and the trends so that people can be thinking about what's coming. And then mathematical models and numerical algorithms are, are still central. Uh, and libraries that exist today that uh, do scale and can be used so that people don't reinvent uh, too many wheels. Programming methodologies. Uh, certainly MPI and OpenMP are the two that we spend the most time on because uh, on Mira, for example, as well as really on Titan, uh, to get very good scaling, typically you, you use MPI, but then you also use OpenMP to use the threading, the hardware threads that I mentioned, four threads uh, per core. So you have 64 threads per node. So MPI plus OpenMP, but we also have people like Kathy Yellick to talk about UPC, Brad Chamberlain to talk about uh, Chapel and uh, Charm++ plus plus, uh, and um, uh, Core Ray Fortran and uh, hybrid programming methodologies. So the most uh, lecture hours and hands-on exercises are dedicated to programming methodologies because they're, we not only want to expose people to what's available and, and actually running and can be used, but also how you can try to avoid trapping yourself into a particular instance of, say, a GPU, which is going to be different day after tomorrow. Uh, there's a lot of hands-on time so that people can use uh, big systems and try out what's going on. So the programming methodology is a lot of it. Software architecture, debugging and performance measurement tools, visualization tools, how do you build community codes. Uh, that's something that many people will end up doing. Um, and methodologies and tools relevant for data intensive and big data applications. So the um, people that we want to attract, and we sure attracted a great bunch uh, last summer, um, are typically doctoral students, postdocs, computational scientists, who already have done some non-trivial scientific or engineering application at scale, at a reasonable scale, on a big parallel machine. So this is not for brand new people. But um, we didn't get permission to advertise until April last year because of, you may remember, Congress was fooling around with budgets a little bit. So uh, first week of April, I finally got the green light to advertising. And I had to set a deadline of May 24th you know, in order to have time to select the right people, et cetera. I got 160 applicants. We could only select 60 because that's what we had planned as a reasonable number to have good one-on-one. -on -one. But we had 160, almost all of them were really good. Um, well, we, we set up a waiting list figuring, well, you know, maybe some of the people we accept won't be able to come. Well, one person only, uh, unfortunately, uh, had to change her plans, um, but she applied for the, uh, she's going to apply for this year. So. Um, just earlier this week, uh, yesterday, um, we started advertising. Uh, the deadline is um, March 31st for applications. HPC Wire um, published uh, uh, yesterday on it, and uh, we'll be casting our net more widely, and, and I'm casting it here. Um, so we hope that uh, some of you uh, have colleagues who would be interested in applying. So we do this um, at a place called the Pheasant Run Resort, which is about uh, 15 miles west of O'Hare Airport in the Chicago area. Uh, we use the older part of the facility. They make you know, some nice new conference center, and we don't use that one. We use kind of an old creaky one, but it's just right for us, and it's really cheap. And um, so we have a lecture hall. We have, as I mentioned, a lot of hands-on exercises. And one of the neat things was to have people like Rusty Lusk, who was one of the um, key people in the MPI standard development, great <coughs> computer scientist, sit down 
with the participants one on one and help them. Same thing with John Miller Crummy, who uh, came and lectured and demonstrated uh, some of his performance measurement tools. Um, you know, the people from Alinea. Uh, so this is one on one contact, as well as lectures by the people who typically came up with the ideas and implemented them, that I think makes it special. That's very intense. We start at 8.30 in the morning and at 9.30 at night. Very few breaks. During lunch, uh, we may show uh, parts of lectures that are videotaped. But during the evenings, during dinner, I had a lecture every night on different topics. These are things that might be of interest. So for example, I had uh, Bob Lucas talk about the D-Wave, perhaps quantum computer, perhaps it isn't. Anyway. Uh, if, if you follow the, that controversy, just to expose people to that. I had uh, Charlie Catlett talk about urban uh, data, you know, which is a big data issue, and uh, mining the data from all kinds of sources and trying to make policy decisions on it. And then um, you know, um, Chris Johnson, who won the Sid Fernback Award uh, in November, very great uh, visualization guy, he gave a, a fantastic evening lecture. So what do the students get? Um, uh, within the United States, we pay for their travel to the site. We pay for the lodging. We pay for all their meals, except for uh, Saturday evening and Sunday. And um, um, yeah, it's uh, very intense. Even these young computational scientists at the end of the first week were a bit ragged, uh, because we go through uh, 1 PM on Saturday even. but. Uh, in their evaluations, they were very, very happy, so it seemed. So uh, to apply, you go to this website. So what's next for LCF? I'm almost out of time. Um, a project called CORAL. Uh, so that's an action that says for the collaboration of Oak Ridge, Argonne, and Livermore. The um, Department of Energy Office of Science, which manages uh, the leadership computing facilities, uh, and the NNSA, which um, funds, of course, uh, Livermore, Los Alamos, Sandia, the, the nuclear weapons-oriented labs, this signed an MOU, an NSA and DOE Office of Science, to collaborate on HPC research and acquisitions. So this has to do with mostly acquisitions. So the plan is that these three labs will each get a system for delivery in 2017. The RFP was issued January 6th, if I remember correctly. And the um, proposals are due February 18th. So you know what many of us are going to be doing uh, the last part of uh, February and early March, reading probably quite a few very large proposals. So um, there will be three systems procured. Lawrence Livermore issued the RFP. Once the selection is made through a competitive process, um, there'll be three contracts, so three separate contracts, one for each of the labs. And two architectural paths will be selected because by policy for risk mitigation and many other reasons, uh, we want to have two different architectural paths, one at Oak Ridge and one at Argonne. And then Livermore can choose whichever one it prefers. Um, now, this is what, early 2014, and we're talking about systems that will be delivered late in 2017 and become production in 2018. It's a long time, but that's the kind of time scale we typically deal with. So there'll be three pretty large systems, and what I said is indicated here. Uh, there will be NRE contracts associated with them so that's non-recurring engineering. Um, so, and that's because you know, we do have a few years in which to uh, at least tweak some of what gets developed. Not fundamental differences, but some that are useful. So the idea is a partnership. It's one RFP, so it's a partnership among the labs, these three labs, um, long-term. But it's also a long-term relationship with the vendors. Now, the Blue Jean family arose through that kind of a partnership between IBM, Argonne, and Livermore, initiated by Livermore. 
Um, and so that's one of the models we're trying to follow here. So for Argon, we call it an ALCF3 project, and the goal is to acquire and deploy 75 to 200 petaflops. So this is on the way to exascale, if we define exascale as exaflops. And, um, and so, of course, we have to prepare the side, make sure we have enough uh, electric power available, say 30 megawatts, because it has to include also disk farms and all the other stuff and um, do what we call an early science program that I'll describe in a moment and prepare for the general users. So we did this for the um, current system, started in 2010, and our system went into production in 2013, what we called early science. So we, Argon, issued a, a request for proposals of code teams to say, would you like to be involved early on, well before the machine is even delivered, to figure out how to use the new machine so that when it goes into production on day one, you can start doing science. We give you a postdoc each. We give you access to simulators, to our regular staff. Sounds pretty good. What do you have to do? Well, you have to put up with a system that's pretty raw and um, tell us what you're experiencing, help us figure out how to get around the problems that inevitably there will be. And then once the machine is shaken down and before it goes into regular production, these projects will get a few months, you know, maybe three to four months, when they can get lots of time and get some scientific results quickly. So we did that with Mira. It worked out really well. Uh, we did that with 16 projects. This time we're going to reduce it to 10 because 16 was pretty demanding. But it, it really made a big difference and indeed a lot of science and engineering was done very early on. In addition, as part of early science, we talk about uh, software tools, and so we work with teams and companies that develop uh, software libraries, codes, measurement tools, so that you know, those tools will be available, implemented on the new system right around the time it goes into acceptance and production. And, and so we did that. We got about 20 tools um, install that way. So um, we're going to do that again. So basically I'm done. A reminder, Argon training program, applications deadline, May 31st. And then another reminder, I mentioned postdocs. We're always in, in the market, if you will, for postdocs. Uh, three a year, we try to have a steady state of nine because we typically keep them for three years. And then we just initiated a special uh, fellowship postdoc named after Margaret Butler, who unfortunately passed away uh, last spring. And um, so um, some of your best students um, might be able to compete for the Margaret Butler Fellowship. The deadline on that is February 28th. So I hope uh, you might be interested in using our systems and you might be encouraging your students or young researchers to apply for time or fellowships or the training program. Thank you very much.